there. Yeah. Thanks. I thought we would, last week when um, I did the webinar with, or two weeks ago when I did the webinar with Tammy, I mentioned that we were going to talk about boundaries today. I don't think that we could ever over, you know, emphasize boundaries. I think boundaries are something that is ongoing. It is a very fluid issue as part of recovery, especially for the betrayed partner. And I want to begin with by establishing something, you know, right off the very, you know, bat. And that is that, you know, boundaries are not put into a place to keep other people out. Boundaries are about letting people in. And how can I safely let them in? How can I create safety for myself as I am navigating my own recovery or through this crisis that has resulted, you know, for me as a betrayed partner? And then how can I use it as well to manage my trauma? And I like to think of the analogy of, you know, guardrails when you're on a windy road and just how safe guardrails help you feel when you're on the side of a mountain. And the purpose is to help you know when you're in danger. They're there to clearly mark what you need along that journey for um, safety. And so in that context and through those lenses, that's what we're going to look at boundaries as at. Um, boundaries serve a couple of functions. Like I mentioned, number one, boundaries are there to create safety. So they protect ourselves and they protect others from what is inappropriate behavior versus appropriate behavior. And so we need to make sure that if we are someone who has a difficult time setting boundaries, we've got to figure out what are the guardrails I put into place, because what's going to end up happening is if I'm not clear on boundaries, and we're going to talk about the different types of boundaries, how to go about setting boundaries, but if I don't have my own boundaries, then I'm going to feel unsafe on a continual basis. And so we'll talk about how to actually go about doing that, kind of the formula I walk the women in my groups through in order to set really healthy boundaries that will help you with the safety issues. Um, they are about defining who we let in, like I mentioned earlier. Who's safe? You know, what are the behaviors that I'm going to allow? So it's about getting clarity as well. Um, what boundaries are not is they are not to punish or control. And I know that I grew up um, not learning a lot about boundaries. And so I mistakenly thought that boundaries were used to control somebody else's behaviors or they were something that you put into place so that somebody knew what their punishment was going to be. And when we remove that from the formula for setting boundaries, it becomes very simple in the approach that we take in boundary setting. What boundary settings our boundary setting is not, it is not focusing on the addict's recovery, although oftentimes we want to, and it kind of falls under that controlling piece. As a betrayed partner, oftentimes I, from my perspective, believe that there is a better way to be doing recovery. And so I might want to set boundaries around how I tell my partner what their recovery needs to look like. Now we can make vulnerable requests and we'll talk about that later. Here's what would create safety for me and we can learn to negotiate. The other thing it is not, it is not about um, determining the specific things that a partner needs to be doing as far as um, their own boundaries. And so I can't tell my betrayed part, my betraying partner, what it is that they need to be doing in order to um, put healthy boundaries in place for me. It's about, comes from me. The locus of control is from me, the betrayed partner. What boundaries are, they are about focusing on your own self-care, your own behaviors, what you need for protection, and any issues that are relating to managing your own crisis responses as well as managing your own trauma. And so what boundaries are is staying out of the fixing and controlling, like I said. And like I mentioned earlier, in adult-adult relationships, we can make a request for a person to change their behaviors, but we can't demand 
action, we can't demand any kinds of behaviors from that other person. So the two types of boundaries we talk about are internal boundaries, which are the boundaries I set and put into place for myself so that others are safe from me. And then the external boundaries I put into place are the types of boundaries that I, the framework, the guardrails I put into place for other people to follow so that I am safe from them. And as we look at boundaries, we have to stop and we have to kind of, first of all, spend some time understanding what is going on with me? What am I experiencing? What are the feelings? Am I feeling out of control? Am I feeling um, like I'm in fear all the time? What are my internal experiences that would indicate to me that I need to put a boundary into place? So typically it's going to be a distressing emotion. I know that I need to put a boundary in place when I've got a lot of anxiety. I might need to check in and see what's that about and kind of look at my reality, what's going on, what's triggering it, and what can I do to create safety around whatever the situation is that might be triggering my anxiety. Another one is resentment. If I find myself in resentment, resentment is always a boundary violation. If I'm feeling resentment towards somebody else. So I need to be able to identify, okay, what is it I'm resentful about? When is my resentment getting triggered? And then again, what can I do to create safety for me so that I stay out of resentment? And that can be both an internal boundary I put in place for myself as well as an external boundary. So an internal boundary in that case might be that I'm going to learn to speak up in the moment when I have a need or a concern rather than shutting down. Because if I don't share authentically what's going on with me, then it in the long run will affect how I relate to you. So when I'm in resentment, I might be harsher in how I use my words. I might be quicker to anger. As an external boundary, it might be that I need to speak, speak up and let you know, here's what I need for safety. And we're going to talk about the areas that we focus on in regards to what do I speak up about so that as I keep these boundaries in place, it's going to keep me out of resentment. Um, the other thing we want to look at is we want to look at after I've determined what is it that's creating for me a distressing emotion, is there a boundary that I can put into place around it? What can I do as far as how do I go about setting it up? How do I put together a boundary? Just basic, simple terms. Boundaries require three things. They require the actual boundary that's going to create safety. Secondly, it's got to have a consequence that's appropriate. And we'll talk about that. And thirdly is the follow through. Now, of all of those three things, the most difficult is the follow through. And the reason it's difficult is because for those of us who have had a hard time learning about boundaries or even being able to have boundaries maybe um, earlier in our life, we might start to backpedal a little bit. And what that teaches the person that we're, we are setting the boundary with, and especially the betraying partners, that we really don't mean what we're saying. And so we're going to feel unsafe, and it's going to throw us back into our distressing emotions. So one of the things we look at in setting a boundary is a time frame. Do I need something to happen within a certain amount of time to feel safe? What would that look like? So would it be helpful? for my partner to complete um, a behavior by a certain time. And pretty much every time we, we get together, we talk about disclosure. Do I need to put a boundary out there on disclosure? And I need to have it within a time frame that's determined by myself with the help of my therapist, both therapists, you know, so that that's gonna create safety. Do I need a specific action? Do I need you to do this or not do this in order to create safety? So that's another thing to look at as well. And then do I also need maybe a specific outcome? Here's what I need. And so I'm going to give you examples of that in just a second. But I think of it as the boundary. Here's the boundary. And if you don't do the boundary, if you don't abide or honor or, you know, maintain this boundary, then. So it's the boundary. And if you choose not to do it, then this is going to happen. So, so for example, it would be when you do this, 
then I will do this. Or if you choose to do this, then I'm going to take steps and do this. And so that's how I frame my boundaries. Okay, it's critical, like I said, you wanna make sure that you follow through. So here's what happens when we establish boundaries oftentimes with people, um, they may not like the boundaries. And so um, the analogy I use with my clients is, if you've ever been around a three or a four-year-old and you're going through a checkout line at the grocery store and they wanna have a pack of gum because you know they put everything there at the eye level for a child and you tell them no and you hold to that boundary because maybe you don't want them to have gum or candy because you're gonna go home and have dinner. What they're gonna do at first is they're gonna throw a fit. They might even have a temper tantrum. But the more you hold to that boundary, then every time you go to the checkout line, that three or four year old is gonna stop asking for gum or candy because they know that you're holding onto that boundary. One of the worst things we can do is hold to a boundary sometimes and not others. We call that intermittent conditioning. And so what happens is we, as humans, we learn, ah, that person really doesn't mean it. And I can just stay with them and stay on them. And chances are, I can get them to a point where they'll back down. So it's really important that you are very intentional and very thoughtful and very thorough when you start to put together your boundaries. I recommend, especially when you're early in recovery, use your therapist for this. Go to somebody, a trusted, wise friend who is good at boundaries. Don't try to do these alone just in case you're not sure exactly how to do it. Sometimes it's better to get feedback and support and help from other people before you start to put your boundaries in place. The other thing to consider as you are putting together your boundaries, besides what's going on internally for me, is in the process of all of this, there's going to be something called the needs that you have that need to be met within the relationship, the safety needs. So what are your safety needs? And we generally look at four areas for safety needs. I'm looking at what are my physical safety needs? What are my spiritual safety needs? What are my relational safety needs? What are my, in our, in our um, practice, we think about thinking as well. We um, talk about physical. So we look at all of these different categories. And as a, as a kind of a really brief education piece on needs, a need is a non-negotiable. A need is something that is very important for the relationship to not only survive, but to thrive. So we think about a need as something that if the relationship doesn't have this set up as a boundary or part of the framework, then the relationship is not going to make it, possibly. And so it's really not open for discussion. So if I'm a betrayed partner, one of the needs I might have is that there is no sexual acting out. That's a need. I need you to be faithful and committed 100% to this relationship so that I can heal. Another need might be because your partner who's got the addiction and has betrayed you maybe has spent money or finances. The need is I need openness. I need access to all of our finances. I need to know what money is being spent. And then we need to put some boundaries around that. So we have to ask ourselves, what are the boundaries that I need in order to stay in this relationship? What do I need to put into place so I can let people in to having a relationship with me? So remember, this is all about what do I need for safety? Um, I find that there's going to be a different varieties and different levels of boundaries, simply because there's going to be some we call bottom line boundaries, right? This is a if this happens, then I am out of the relationship. This cannot happen. I call that a bottom line boundary. But there's also some other boundaries that we put into place that if something occurs within the relationship that is not a bottom line, but it's creating for me that lack of safety, what do I do as far as the consequence? And remember, we wanna keep this very simple. So generally when I'm following through on a boundary, it's that I cannot be in relationship with you because it doesn't feel safe. So if you have a slip 
with pornography. And the agreement is that you come and let me know within 24 hours and you choose not to do that, then, and you don't provide the safety I need in discussing it and working through it together, then I may need to sleep alone. Or I may need to go somewhere and do some self-care for a while. Maybe it's for several hours. Maybe I need to go reach out to a friend. And so it's really important to understand that we've got some negotiables and some non-negotiables that are going to be there. To me, a negotiable is more of a want. Like, I want in recovery for us to have a date night every week because then that's when I feel really close to you. Well, if you don't have a date night, the relationship's going to survive. Now, a need might be is I need to go on a date with you where we're not doing any recovery talk because I want this moment to connect with you and I want us to go do it in an environment where it feels safe and to talk about all this heavy recovery stuff doesn't feel safe. And so that would be another example. Um, the other thing, so when I work with my clients, I'm gonna tell you the steps that I, I talk them through and what I have them do. The first thing we do, like I told you, is we look at the non-negotiable needs. So what are my needs? So we look at those different areas. What do I need as far as you know emotional needs? What are my physical needs? What are my sexual needs? What are my spiritual needs? What are my thinking needs, my relational needs? And then we make a list and we put together what we call our bill of rights. So I have a right to physical safety in my home. What does that mean? That means that my personal self, my body, I have a right to give someone permission to touch me or my physical space to be in my space at a certain time. So as a betrayed partner in recovery, I have a right to determine when somebody can come into the bathroom when I'm there or stays out. I have a right to create a barrier. I might be locking a door, shutting a door, or even my own physical property. You know, I have a right to, you know, holding on to my money in my wallet and nobody going in and just taking it. So... That's an area to look at and looking at your emotional needs. What do you have a right? It might be, I have a right to share my feelings. And, I, and my internal boundary would be, I'm going to be really, really grounded as I'm sharing my feelings. I'm not going to be dysregulated so that I can create safety for my partner in that moment. But I have a right to speak up. I have a right to show up authentically. I have a right to experience my experience, to share it and not have somebody minimize it or tell me all the reasons why I shouldn't be feeling that way. Um, other examples, I have a right to ask for what I need. I have a right to, um, you know, go out and take care of myself without having being told that I, I shouldn't be spending so much time on myself, especially when we're in recovery. Self-care is so important. And I have a right to even share my story with those that are safe. And so again, that might be something that can be negotiated with the betraying partner, like who is safe? Well, for example, the work that I do, we've got a group. So that is a safe container. We're all bound by confidentiality agreements and in that place, we can talk about it. And so I do believe that we need to be careful in the boundaries we set around how I, who I tell my story to, are they trustworthy? And sometimes we need to bring in the betraying partner to discuss that as well. Um, I have a right to be imperfect and make mistakes because let's face it, when we're going through recovery, we're going to make mistakes and we're going to make mistakes in the boundaries reset as well. And sometimes we're going to have to redo our boundaries because we do make a mistake and they don't, it doesn't turn out very well. So boundaries are one of those things, like I said, are fluid. Some are less fluid than others. We do have our bottom line, non-negotiables, but around other things, we have to look at, okay, sometimes maybe that boundary wasn't so great. For example, I had um, one client, this is a long time ago, who um, she basically told her husband that if he didn't come home on time, then she was going to um, throw all these stuff out on the front porch and he didn't come home on time. And so when he came home, 
she had taken his clothes and dumped it on the front porch. Well, as we talked through that, we realized what she was triggered by. We realized that she had there was some lack of safety that she created for him, that she had some internal boundaries that she needed to maybe look at and reestablish. And then we talked about, okay, what would be a healthier way to set up an external boundary with him to create safety? So a boundaries are one of those things that, like um, I tell many of my clients, if you're constantly being triggered, if you're in resentment, if you're having a lot of fear, if you're having a lot of anxiety, let's look at boundaries. Where are your boundaries? Because one boundary that you need to establish fairly early in recovery is that as the betrayed partner, your healing is not about how well the betraying partner or the addict partner does their recovery. It's about focusing on you and it's about making sure that you're taking care of you and that your focus is on healing you. So anyway, that's just a few of my ideas on boundaries. There's so many different ways we can go, but um, that's kind of what I thought about and some of the things that come up. So again, let me just go through. First of all, I identify when I've got a distressing emotion that indicates that I might have some boundaries that are either lacking or being violated that I need to look at. Secondly, I need to be very clear on what are my non-negotiables? What is it that I need to have to feel safe in this relationship so that I can let you in? Thirdly, have I put together my bill of rights? Do I know exactly what I have a right to? And there's lots of good resources out there that you can go to. And I have resources as well. So you're welcome to reach out to me and I will share with you a list of bill of rights so that I've got clarity. This is my bill of rights is what I'm gonna then base my boundaries on. Then lastly, I'm gonna put into place my boundaries. So here's the boundary I need for safety. And if you choose not to keep it in place, then this is gonna be the consequence. The majority of the time, the consequence is that you're not safe for me to be around or be in relationship. So I need to step back out of the relationship to create safety for myself. It's very simple. It's just almost kind of like a, a natural consequence. And then lastly, I've got to make sure that I have a plan for follow through. So when I follow through and I'm, I'm kind of hesitating and I know I need to follow through, can I turn to my group? Can I turn to you know my trusted friend who's helped me work on those boundaries? Can I turn to my therapy and go in with my therapist and maybe work on the under, re, underlying reasons why it's hard for me to follow through? So anyway, that's kind of the step. We then have our clients go through and fill out worksheets in these each of these different areas with here's the area that I need it physical, right? Here's the boundary. Here's the consequence. And here's how I'm going to have my support in place for follow through. So consider doing that. I think that's really good. Um, I want to also just reiterate, too, that internal boundaries are just as important as external boundaries. So think about that as well. The boundaries I put in place for myself is important. So as um, healing um, partners, I want you to think about um, some of these internal boundaries. And this is my last thought. And that is um, have a boundary to recognize when you're in trauma. Have a, a, an agreement that I'm going to check in with myself on a regular basis to see what's going on with me. And if I'm in any distressing emotion, then I'm gonna take the necessary steps to take care of myself. If that means I need to physically remove myself when all of a sudden I've gone limbic, when I'm no longer in my prefrontal cortex in my logic and reasoning, then I'm gonna set an internal boundary that I take a break and that I step back and I do some self-care. And that one of my internal boundaries is, is that I'm always mindful of what my needs are. I'm mindful of acknowledging my pain and allowing myself to feel those things. I am giving myself permission to reach out to others for help. And I am taking the necessary steps to ground myself so that I can re-enter a relationship that might be creating the distress for myself. That is a huge one right there. If betraying partners could just kind of come up with a plan for that. It makes it so much easier in the long run to continue to 
establish boundaries and discuss them, negotiate them and follow through with them. So anyway, those are my ideas on boundaries. And I would love anybody's additional questions or any experiences you've had with boundaries that have been successful or maybe some areas where you're struggling. Um, thank you, Debbie. Everybody um, type some questions into the Q&A. Um, in the interim, uh, I've got a couple of thoughts and some questions. I always, um, I always, I love the serenity prayer mm -hmm. when it comes to boundaries. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, which is you. <laughs> the wisdom to change the, or the, the, the courage to change the things I can, which is me and my attitude and my thinking and my behavior and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, and, you know, sometimes we hear boundaries described as you stay in your hula hoop, I'll stay in my hula hoop, we have mm -hmm. good boundaries. And basically it's, I can control me. I can't control you. If you're driving me crazy today, I can't control your behavior. I can tell you how I feel. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, it's, if, it's, if I'm having a powerful feeling, like I'm getting resentful or anxious or whatever, I can, I can tell you, you know, when you do this, I feel really anxious and I'm, I'm afraid that our relationship is disintegrating. Um, it would really help me if you would do this and instead of that. And if you're going to continue to behave in the way that's upsetting me, then then we do the consequences. And mm -hmm. and um, but I, I just love the serenity prayer because it reminds me um, what I can control and what I can't. <laughs> and and I you know when I came into recovery, I was and I, I speak as an addict because I'm an addict, not the betrayed partner. But you know I really thought if everybody else just did what what I wanted them to do, life would be great. <laughs> and it made me angry that you all would not do what I wanted you to do. Um, and it took me a long time to figure out that it's none of my business. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, you know, in our, in the work that we do in our groups, we actually have the partners that have been betrayed. We have them write their own serenity prayer. And then we ask them to memorize it. And to use that at those times, like you said, where they feel like they don't have any control, where they're feeling like life is never going to get better, that they're never going to heal from their betrayal, you know, trauma or the crisis they're in. Um, and it's such a, uh, like you said, it's such a quick way to kind of reframe, I think, the situation we're in in the moment. So I love that. And that concept of that serenity prayer is all about, right, letting go of control. Because oftentimes it's when we're in that that air that space of I've got to control this right. It just spirals us down into so many other negative emotions like fear. Yeah, and I think most of the conflict in in recovery after betrayal is partners wanting to control each other. Um, I hear from betrayed partners all the time. How can I get him to fill in the blank? Mm -hmm. And then I hear from the cheating partners all the time or the recovering partner all the time i'm doing all the things i'm supposed to be doing why won't she let it go and trust me why can't we you know i want to control her she wants to control. i'm being sexist here sorry you know she mm -hmm. wants to control my recovery and i want to control her you know i want to speed up her process of learning to trust me again mm -hmm. um and i think both of those things i mean they both take time, but how do you deal with when you have that dynamic in a relationship where they're both trying to control each other? Um, how do you get them to step away from that and focus on myself and you focus on yourself so then we can come back together later when we're a little healthier? That's a great question. I mean, I, this just came up this last week for me with a client and I kind of had to remind her, okay, we kind of kind of look at this like, you know, you're both kind of on this journey right and 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 the tendency is is we want to kind of tell the person how that their journey needs to look and so we have to remember that it looks different for not only the betrayed partner but for the recovering partner and so we've got to kind of be aware of that i know that the the particular client was just you know two years into it and feeling like um gosh you know I don't feel like I'm any better. I'm still getting triggered, right? And, and you know, we talked about, hey, there's some boundaries here we've got to work on, but let's look at 
from, you know, what he's doing. Let's look at the fact that he's working his recovery and it's going to look different than yours. And so some of those things that you're wanting him to do, it might be further down the road. It doesn't mean he's not in recovery. So sometimes, you know, we just have to identify, okay, really in your journey, what's part of your journey. And right now, maybe that's not it. Um, the other thing that oftentimes is giving them the skill set to talk about these things. How can I actually just share with you, hey, it, this would create safety for me. Can I make this vulnerable request? You know, you going to your therapist on a consistent basis, it makes me feel safer in this moment, at this point in time in our journey. And when you when I see you going to your therapist, then I want to move towards you. I feel like I can talk to you, you know, easier. I feel like you're safer. Another one too is sometimes we can put a boundary into place. I think couples should talk about what does my recovery look like versus yours. Now, this is going to require we're in a place where we can both be grounded and let's say, okay, would you be willing to share, you know, about, you know, what you're learning? If you have any aha moments, you know, can we sit down once a week? Can we set a boundary around that? about sharing. And again, you know, I'm not sure that this is a non-negotiable. This might be more of those wants. And hopefully we can get you to where all of a sudden you're going, yeah, this is a real need to kind of share. We're now in a space where we feel safe so that we can share. Again, if you're wanting to control, sometimes um, you might need to go in and work with your therapist on that to kind of figure out the why. Why do you want to control? You know, are there other areas in your life where you feel out of control? Is this a pattern that's been, you know, part of your life or, you know, you know, just shows up quite often? And how can we figure out how to maybe manage your anxiety that you're having? You know, what can you do for yourself to get out of that, that pattern? So oftentimes I, I look at the patterns that are going on between the couple two and especially the individual that I'm working with. What's your pattern? You know, and can we do this differently? Can we put some internal boundaries in place around it? And then are there some external boundaries that you need to, to put in place with your partner? You know, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we're gonna jump into the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say you're my betrayed partner, I've betrayed you. You need to know everything that happened. You genuinely need it. Mm -hmm. I'm two weeks into recovery, I am neck deep in denial and, and I'm still lying to myself about what happened. Mm -hmm. I can't give you a full therapeutic discovery right now. How do we negotiate that when I, I get it that you need this, but my therapist is also looking at me going, no. <laughs> right. Know? And as a betrayed partner, I have to have a good internal boundary that says, okay, I've got to honor that. I have to. I've got to kind of trust the process. And I've got to have a good internal boundary that I'm not going to take it out on you know, the addict, you know, partner, the recovering partner too, because I might want to. And that's a really hard space to be. I'm not going to lie because as a therapist, as I'm working with somebody, when they're in that space between, I just discovered this and now I've got to wait how many months to get everything in order and everything put into place so that when we do that therapeutic, formal healing disclosure, that it, it ends up being what it needs to be about reestablishing trust and creating safety and, and working through shame and, and staying regulated and all of that. that and, I, and so we've got to kind of figure out, okay, you, you can't, as a betrayed partner, sometimes go to them and start interrogating. I got to know this, 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 and this. And so what can I do? What are the, some boundaries I can put into place? Can I turn to my group and tell them I'm really struggling right now and have them share with me what they've done in the past to help get out of that struggle? Can I go out and do some self-care? Can I go walk around the block and get myself regulated? Can I journal and get it out? Maybe write down the questions that I want to have answered. So in the future, I can refer to it and I don't, I don't need it right now. So yeah, it is. It, I'm not going to lie. That's hard work. It takes having a lot of clarity. So oftentimes I'll work in session with my clients about, okay, let's establish what are your boundaries you're going to put in place around this. Okay, so what are you going to do when you get triggered and you want to do that? What's the boundary? Okay, so what if that doesn't work? What are you going to do? Okay, if that doesn't work, what's your next step that you're going to do? And then we're also probably going to put boundaries in place. Like I, as, as a cheater, I promise I will give you full disclosure by February 15th. 
Yes. And then I, I better hold that boundary. <laughs> yes. And what I love about that is if they know a date, yeah. here is disclosure date. It is so regulating for the betrayed partner. It's like, okay, finally, you know, finally, I know there's an end to this yeah. and I'm never, I'm not going to keep wondering. And again, when we talk about thinking boundaries, I mentioned thinking boundaries earlier. And, you know, some of that is I can let my thoughts go some pretty crazy places. And that can happen, especially if it's like open-ended. They say, you say you're going to do disclosure, but I don't know when you won't commit you know, am I, is it ever going to happen? Our thoughts can go crazy. So I love the fact that, you know, putting into place, I need to have a disclosure date put, you know, on the calendar to work towards so that I can just kind of help regulate my thoughts. And I'm not going to come and interrogate you and do all sorts of crazy safety seeking, right? I call the, you know, the less healthy, I should say, safety uh, seeking, right? Because I'm trying to find answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't have to go into that. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, great, great questions. Yeah, I love this first question here. Um, this is from a trade partner. My sex addict husband is a very sweet person since I met him. He, he has always complimented me, or told me I'm beautiful and complimented my appearance. I've always felt so loved by that. However, since discovery, these compliments hurt me. Um, it makes me feel like he's lying. It makes me feel very uncomfortable. My feelings are, if you really thought I was beautiful, you wouldn't act out. Um, I've asked him to stop saying these things, but he doesn't understand. He feels like that I should feel good about these compliments just like before. What should I do? Um, it's something small, but it really upsets me. Uh, this is so, you know, it's very valid. What you're experiencing it happens. And we have something called talking boundaries. That's another category we have is talking boundaries. And I think this falls into that category. And so the boundary that you would set with your partner is in the past, that has made me feel safe and want to move towards you. But right now, while I am experiencing, you know, the crisis of betrayal, I am experiencing, you know, the emotional pain, even maybe feeling physical pain from this. To hear that takes me back into that. So the boundary is, is while I am working on my own recovery from betrayal trauma, I need you to not say this, this, or this to me because it takes me into even deeper into my betrayal trauma. And if you choose to say those things to me, then I'm going to immediately tell you to stop. And then I'm going to remove myself from the situation and go take care of myself. Or I may have to limit my conversations with you for a little bit while I'm, you know, and I don't know, you know, I don't believe in not talking. I don't believe that's not what I'm saying, but it might be, we can't talk about deeper things for right now. It might be, we can't talk about appearances. We can't talk about loving each other in this moment because it takes me into my betrayal. So my talking boundary is I don't feel safe in talking about this at this point in my journey. Yeah. And, you know, one of the other things I'll say, and by the way, this does not discount anything Debbie just said. It's a, what Debbie just said is smack on target. Um, but I also want you to, to know, and you'll learn this as part of your recovery, is his, he wasn't acting out at you. Um, it was about his need to escape. It's not because he doesn't think you're beautiful. It's not because he doesn't love you. I'll ask guys who cheat, was she as pretty as your wife? Oh, God, no. Was she as good in bed? No. Was she smart? No. Was she funny? No. Why'd you do it? He was an escape. You know. It's, you know, it's not about the betrayed partner. It feels like it is. I get it. Um, but it, but it's not. And as you get deeper into recovery and learn more about his addiction, um, I hope you'll be able to see that. And then maybe at some point you'll be able to accept what sound like genuine compliments, even though they don't feel that way right now. Yeah. And I appreciate coming from your perspective, you sharing that because it's, you're right. It's absolutely true. It's interesting because, you know, addicts are really good at compartmentalizing and it's so separate and it has nothing. One doesn't relate to the other, but for the betrayed partner, it does. It does. And so it doesn't feel like they love you. It doesn't feel like, you know, they believe that you're beautiful or that, you know, that your appearance is adequate because if it was, why, why did you act out? And so part of that is, 
they've got to reestablish the trust for you. And, and as they work their recovery and there's that consistency and the reliability and you see that they've got the integrity and they've got good boundaries, boundaries are really, really essential for reestablishing trust. Then down the road, you're going to start to feel safer and safer in that relationship. You'll understand the, the addiction a little more and your, as you get out of your own crisis, then you might be able to kind of finally connect the dots on that, but it takes time. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, next one, I am a betrayed partner. I understand that my boundaries are about my safety and about my healing rather than my partner's recovery. I can see how the consequences uh, of crossing are a way for me to create space for myself, but often that space doesn't fix the boundary need for safety that was violated. <coughs> I also feel like it doesn't quite address the pain of the boundary violation. Yeah. Um... You're right. There's there, and that that's such a process too. You're right. We can kind of separate that out too. And I think that that's something to work with in your with your individual therapist, which is going to be the fact that that pain is so deep. I recognize that, and so because um, I see with that question, I think there's two things there. I think that you're asking is. Um, how to create safe for yourself, space for yourself doesn't fix the boundary need for safety and that was violated and it doesn't address the pain of the boundary violation. So it's really true. And I think you need to identify for yourself, what is it that I need? It goes back to needs. What do I need you know, to fix the pain of the boundary violation? And so for some couples down the road, that is when we come back together with, right, the addicts done their work, um, they're in recovery, they've now, they're in a place of empathy, right, they're, they're now understanding, they're working through their shame, they're in a place where they can now start to recognize the pain that they created in you. And then for you, as you're working through and understanding what you're, you know, what the pain is about, what did it make you feel, what are the underlying beliefs, and being able to come together in couples work. I see that's where we, uh, we end up addressing a lot of that, where I work, because there is that pain and we've got to talk about it. And again, that also requires that, you know, the addict partner, they need to be able to learn how to hold space so that you can talk about your pain. And so it might be that you're working on negotiating, how can I come to you and I talk to you about all this pain it's creating for me and do it in a way where you can hold that space and listen and validate my pain. And so for a betraying partner, you gotta have a really good internal boundary that is when my betrayed partner comes to me talking about the pain that I was responsible for creating in them, that I have to kind of put up my shield that allows me to hear hard things, right? And I don't take it personally and I can let her talk about it. And so boundary around that is the betrayed partner is that I need to have time to be able to talk to you about how I'm in pain and how my pain has caused me so much distress and where it's taking me. And I need you to be able to be grounded while we do that and to have empathy. And that's a, that's a very um, valid boundary. And if you can't do it, then I'm just gonna take a break, right? I'll call a timeout and then we'll come back together within 24 hours and let's try to talk about it again. So I think that's fair as well. Yeah, and I, I think we can have a whole webinar on how, oh. to, how to listen and without getting defensive and and then and then show some empathy <laughs> like that would be great into that is, is that's a whole webinar right there <laughs> right there you how do i recognize that my shame's come up and how does it show up and yeah. then well how does it prevent me from being able to talk about hard things and then how do i let it go so that i can sit in that and that's i think where we create the space right in that moment is where we create the space it's like i tell my clients that you know, the healing space is at that point of empathy. It's when both partners can get to this place of, you know, I can kind of understand how you're feeling. I can, I can verbalize back to you 
this is how you must be feeling. I can relate to that feeling. And to me, that's, that's the moment where we can kind of fix some of the pain is just validating. I caused this in you and you know, you have every right to feel this way and I can see why you do. I would feel that way if that was done to me. That's a real, that's that space where we create the healing. Um, this next question I'm going to summarize. Um, this is an individual who has a partner who does not accept boundaries. The partner's narcissistic oh. and just does not accept them. What now? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's a tough one. And we can go through a whole, we can go whole through. Th when you're dealing with somebody who's got those types of tendencies, um, that's a whole thing on gaslighting. And we could do a whole thing on gaslighting, which might be a really great topic, you know, in the future as well. Um, because you have to learn to be, be very clear when you're dealing with somebody who doesn't honor boundaries, then that means you've got to be very clear on your boundaries and you've got to follow through on your boundaries, regardless of the consequence. Because oftentimes, if you're dealing with somebody who's got those types of behaviors, and they're more narcissistic on the spectrum, then there always is going to be a negative consequence. Most likely there's gonna be a very negative consequence. So how do I hold you know, myself to the boundary? And then how do I go and I get my need met with somebody else who's healthy? So that's the other thing too is uh, as a reminder. And, and by the way, this question was about a former partner. So, so a former partner, okay. <laughs> Well, that I makes my sense. Here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, obviously, because it's very, very hard. If somebody doesn't recognize boundaries, honor your boundaries, it is hard to stay in relationship with them. I'm not going to lie. Now, I do see, and this is just, you know, therapy, according to Debbie, that sometimes as the addict is kind of working through the reality of, hey, I am an addict and taking on, you know, that awareness of, yes, I have a problem. I'm out of denial, you know, and I'm getting, and I'm, I'm out of my shame. That space when they're in denial and they're still dealing with their shame, they can appear to be kind of narcissistic. Some of their behaviors can appear that way. And so, you know, I tell my clients, you recognize this could just be their denial and their shame coming forward, and it's going to get better down the road. So if you don't see it getting better and they're not improving, yeah, you might, you might have to step back and go, okay, what is it that I'm willing? What are my bottom lines on this? If I have a partner that can't recognize, you know, my boundaries and honor them and, um, and let me allow me to have them that could be a non-negotiable that it's like, I can't stay in a relationship, you know, unless I'm allowed to have healthy boundaries. Absolutely. Um, I love this next question too. So far in my recovery, I've gotten better at setting boundaries and following through. However, I tend to buckle or feel guilty and self-critical after the follow through along the lines of, did I really need to put that boundary there? Um, are there any tools to avoid this and hold strong to the things I've decided I need? Absolutely. Great tools. Okay. I tell my clients, number one, designate your person who's your boundary upholder. I will tell them, think about your friend or family member who is so clear at letting you know what their expectations are of the relationship and they hold to it. Now, a good therapist will do that as well. You'll notice that they've got boundaries and they'll hold to it or a trusted friend who's really boundaried. Now, I love what Brene Brown says about boundaries and I'm paraphrasing her and is it, it's, my, it's that you might not be viewed as being the kindest person, but you're gonna be far more compassionate because with your boundaries, you're staying out of resentment, right? And so think about that. Sometimes boundaries are kind of, somebody holds, upholds a boundary with me, I kind of go, whoa. And then I think, no, that was actually really good that they did that. I, I appreciate the fact that they were very clear and very direct and let me know where they stood on that. And they did it in a very compassionate way. Okay, so find somebody you can turn to. The other thing is when you're in a moment of clarity, journal all of the reasons why you need to follow through. What are the reasons for the follow through? I'm following through because I know it's the right thing to do. I'm following through because I know that in the long run, it's going to help me feel safe and able to connect. 
I'm following through because put all of those down. I also tell my clients, journal all the reasons why you might not. Again, this isn't a moment when I'm grounded. I've got a lot of clarity. And just remind yourself, here's the reasons why you need to follow through. So sometimes going back to my own words is a really, really good um, place to start. I'll tell my clients, take notes in your phone. Notice, is there a certain time of day? Is there a certain circumstance it's around? So we're looking for, first of all, am I better at following through during the early part of the day as opposed to later at night when I'm tired, right? Do I have a tendency to, am I too distracted? So I forget what my boundaries are and I don't double check. And so I just kind of let them go. So check and see, do I have a pattern to it? Is it around the time of day? Is it around the circumstance? Is it around a certain type of boundary? So get some clarity on that. And then maybe sit down and in those quiet moments, kind of work on it yourself or take it into therapy or take it to your group or go into a drop-in group and ask about it and get feedback from other people. Um, next one here. I'm the sex addict and my betrayed partner has done a really good job with her boundaries, both for our relationship and for herself. Um, I don't really feel like I have any boundaries or that I should be able to set boundaries as the betrayer. Lately, I've been struggling with finding time for self-care other than getting good sleep. What, if any boundaries, could I set for myself? Is it okay if I don't have boundaries? I'm going to answer that last question. No, it's not okay. You need boundaries. Okay, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> you do need boundaries. And especially, I'm going to say, you've got to really have strong boundaries around your self-care. I know that um, in our practice at Family Strategies, um, one of the things they really hit hard with those that are recovering is the self-care part, big time, because that is so key, that and connection with other people, right? Having a support system, reaching out, reaching out, but that self-care is so important. And I, I do see that oftentimes the betrayed partner, sometimes they get a little bit irritated or even upset when that you know, the recovering partner is holding to their boundaries regarding self-care. So that would be one that I challenge my clients on because I do work with the betrayed partners. And that is, if it is self-care, let's stop and let's look at and go, okay, it's not about you not wanting them to do self-care. Do we need to go back and do we need to negotiate maybe the timing on it? Do we need to negotiate frequency you know, and, or, you know, is there some little points that maybe you could re make it that vulnerable request, but as far as doing or not doing boundaries, I, as a, as a recovering partner, you do need to have really clear boundaries and you have a right to have boundaries. You have the same bill of rights. You have the same format. You need to have internal and external boundaries and an external boundary for somebody who is in recovery is that maybe that you don't let things go limbic. You don't let there be screaming and yelling. You want to be grounded because it's all about creating connection. Remember, everything we do is about, I've got to create this, um, this boundary is there so that I can move towards you and connect with you. It's about interdependency, right? It's about, we can come together in a healthy way and so you do need to have that as well. So call the time out if things get emotional and we're dysregulated. And I, I'll tell, you know, both, you know, the betrayed partners and the betrayed partners that just say, hey, let's put a pause on this. I care about you. I want to discuss this with you. And but right now we're emotional. We can't get anything done. So can we get back together and 30 minutes and two hours in the morning, tomorrow night at the same time. So now I'm telling my partner, hey, I care about you. Let's take a pause. Let's come back together. That's very, very valid. And, and so go into your therapist too. If you're having a hard time as the recovering partner in setting boundaries, check and see what that's about because that, that might be connected to your addiction as well. And part of the pattern that plays out there. There's, there's a Shame drives addiction. Shame also prevents us from setting healthy boundaries. Um, yes. You know, uh, and I, you know, I, I, in the work groups I teach, I teach sex addiction uh, work groups and porn addiction work groups, six weeks, low cost, online. Go to our Seeking Integrity site, click work groups. You can find them. They're like 350 bucks for six weeks. Um, 
And they're great. We walk you through a lot of this, including circle plans. And when we get the circle plans, we talk about the outer circle or the green light circle, mm -hmm. you know, the things that are healthy for you to do. And, you know, when guys first do those, they, they just put in a whole bunch of recovery stuff. And I'm like, do you ever want to have any fun again? And they're like, well, I don't deserve to. I, I just, and I'm like, no, you need to have some fun. I mean, the best relationships involve two separate, fully fleshed out people who come together. And if all you do is recovery, you are not a fully fleshed out person. And you're, you're going to have part of a relationship that's really good, but you're going to have part of a relationship that you're eventually going to resent because you're not allowed to meet your needs. Um, it's important that you meet your needs. It's important for your relationship that your needs get met too. I mean, both people's needs get met by the relationship. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, um, it is 2.30. Um, we have, oh, we have a couple more questions. Do you want to take one more? Or? Sure, let's do okay, one. We'll okay, um, Debbie, last time you gave me tips on how to use my voice and hyp hypnosis. Um, I don't know what, if you talked about hypnosis last time. Um, I use my own creativity and I set up my own visualization exercise and I am, imagine the abusive man locked up in a cell or on a chair. And in my fantasy, you were with me, <laughs> holding me and guiding me. And I said what I wanted to say. Yeah. I am not finished with this project process, but I just wanted to share with you. Um, I am not from the US, so it's unfortunate I can't reach out to you. That is lovely. I'm so glad. I love that. And sometimes we do that. I do a visualization with my partners where right now maybe your your recovering, you know, addict partner can't hear what you need to say to them. And so we set up, I've got a whole visualization I do with my clients where they have a conversation in their mind with their partner that's very safe. We create safety. They can say what they need to say. And so it is, the brain is interesting because the brain doesn't know the difference between what's really happening and the imagination. So we can use that guided imagery, that type of a thing to get that sense of, okay, I've been able to say what I need to say. And it helps us practice for the future when we want to say something and say hard things as well. So thank you for sharing that. It's a great idea. Yeah, I want to ask this. I'll be right there. I want to ask this one last question. Um, this is from a great partner who said a bottom line, don't sleep with prostitutes again. He did. She left. Um, mm -hmm. Now she's at her mom. She's trying to decide if she wants this marriage. How many bottom lines do you give? Um, well, you can't have a huge list. That's for sure. But I think there's, I find with most women that are recovering and men recovering from betrayal is at the most, you're going to have two or three bottom lines. Now, are you going to go back in and renegotiate that bottom line? It's up to you because you've got to remember, we've got to look at a relationship. It's not black and white. There's a lot of gray here. So I've got to look at, okay, you know, where is my partner in their recovery, their awareness, their willingness to work? I mean, there's just so many parts to that. It's it's so so black and white is sometimes this was my my bottom line, but then I've got to look at and, and do I leave the relationship? But yet we have children and there's finances to consider and there's so many other things. And so I think there is no black and white answer to that. Um, but as far as bottom lines, we can't have everything be a bottom line. We can't have 10 bottom lines because then it's just like, it is such a harsh boundary, right? Because we look at boundaries. Boundaries need to be porous. They sometimes come and go. We sometimes have to redo them as opposed to boundaries that are so solid that, you know, there's, it's, they're so rigid that we never, ever alter them. And, but certain bottom lines need to be rigid. So for you, it's just kind of sitting in this, okay, kind of determining if I do go back, what does that mean? What would be the boundaries around it? What if it happens again? What am I going to do? You know, and if I do go back and I, I've given my partner three or four times, do they really believe me? So there's a lot for you to kind of dissect there. There's a lot to that and a lot to unpack. Yeah. And I wish um, we had time to do it. Yeah. Um, Debbie, thank you so much. Um, thank you for running over. Um, Debbie gives us her time and now has given us some extra time today. So thank you. You're um, so welcome.
for those of us who joined us late, I will get this posted on our uh, Sex and Relationship Healing YouTube channel as, as soon as it's available, probably within an hour or so. So if you want to if you want to check out this, because this was this was fabulous. Um, so Debbie, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm loving that I get to fill in with you once in a while. I know I am, too. Thank you so <laughs> much. You're welcome. You um, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. And uh, we'll see you next month. Take care, everybody. Bye.